Today, we're talking about one of the most ignored groups in the personal finance world, renters. If you're one, you already know how unaffordable it's getting, especially in big cities. So how are people dealing with the rising cost of rent? And what does it mean for their other financial goals and for their life? Welcome to Stress Test, a podcast about personal finance for Gen Z and millennials. I'm Rob Carrick, personal finance columnist at The Globe and Mail. And I'm Roma Luzio, personal finance editor at The Globe. So Rob, much like home ownership, there was a period at the start of the pandemic where the situation was briefly better for renters and how at that time you could actually try to negotiate with your landlord for a better deal, cheaper rent or some kind of improvements to your rental unit. The current situation is nothing like that. So what's changed? Well, there was a period at the beginning of the pandemic when the renter finally had some leverage. Uh, renters were moving out of their properties. Landlords were desperate to keep people in their units, and they were offering rent cuts in some in, in some situations, or no, at least no rent increase. And that's over now. Uh, landlords are back to having the upper hand, and um, all of a sudden, the golden period for renting is now over. We're back to the world where rents are rising, and it's getting increasingly unaffordable to rent. In order to find out what's happening in the rental sphere, we did a call out. Response was huge, and we basically invited the renters of Canada to talk to us, to share their experience, to tell us their stories. We had over 5,000 people respond to the poll that we put out, and that is separate from the hundreds of emails we got from happy and unhappy renters. Let's go through some of the things that we found out during our call out. One of the interesting things that I thought was that uh, almost 40% of people think they're renting forever because they'll never be able to afford to buy a house. And another close to 30% just don't know what's what the outlook is. They uh, they have no confidence that they're going to be getting into a house. Uh, and then we, we asked people about their feelings about renting. So 55% said renting has its upside, but they'd rather own. 22% said they dislike it or hate it, and almost a quarter were like it or love it. So, um, you know, I, I think that we have to get out of the poor renter narrative. A lot of people are perfectly happy doing this. I thought the other interesting thing here was that almost 70% of them were not too worried or not worried at all about being evicted or renovicted. And more than 40% of the 5,000 people that responded said that their rental unit was a two-bedroom or larger place. So what we tend to see is the single narrative about renting, you know, the tiny condo in the downtown core. We hear all about the banned landlords and the rent evictions, and all these things are happening with rentals. But in reality, the story is much more varied. There are all kinds of rentals out there, multi-bedroom apartments, entire houses, and there's also a fair amount of positive rental stories we heard about from readers with people renting for decades with good landlords and with at least some of these renters taking advantage of some of the benefits that renting has to offer. So at least not everyone is miserable renting. In today's episode, we're talking to three Canadians about their experiences renting. First up, we'll hear from a renter who feels stuck in her situation and has dealt with some nightmare landlords. That's up next. Being a renter means you're dealing with landlords or rental companies. Many of them are fine, but some can be difficult. For Gen Z and Millennials who move out of their family home for school or work, renting is the go-to option. Our first guest is someone who's lived in many rentals since moving back to Canada for school. Yeah, my name is Paula. I am a journalist currently in Kelowna, um, and I am a 25-year-old millennial. <laughs> Trying to apply for places to live in Kelowna was more stressful than finding a job. I was stressed out beyond belief, and I think it was... It wasn't until I think a few weeks before I was supposed to move here that I finally found a place. Paula was born in Quebec and raised in Taiwan. In 2014, she moved to Kelowna for university at UBC's Okanagan campus. She lived in student housing for the first two years and then off campus until graduation. Then she moved to Toronto for her master's degree. 
Last July, Paula moved back to Kelowna for her first job out of school. Compared to rental prices from 2017, it's so much more expensive this time around. At that time, I have friends who were renting rooms for like 500 a month, like 600 a month. That was pretty standard at the time. And then that continued on until I think my fourth and fifth year of university. Like that price point just kind of was like it obviously increased a little like a fair bit, but it was still you can still find rooms for 500, 600 easy in certain parts of the city. And then I left for two years to go to Toronto for school. And then when I come back, I was just like, whoa, because one bedrooms are suddenly a thousand five hundred a month. A uh, bedroom, like to rent a bedroom, like it's averaging like nine hundred, even a thousand now. Paula lucked out finding her place. The rent is one third of her income, and that includes internet and utilities. For for my place, six hundred seventy five a month was considered a steal, and I was just very shocked because I came back. I was just like, wait, we're not Toronto nor Vancouver. I don't remember the city being super glamorous. What happened? It was kind of a shock coming back two years later to see that the housing market has gone up so astronomically. It's actually insane. I think people were talking about the housing market and how COVID would burst a bubble here in the Okanagan, but the reality is it did not because people are buying houses more than they're selling here during COVID. Because of Kelowna's low vacancy rate, finding a place is super competitive. Landlords request a lot of documents from would-be renters like Paula. Oh, boy. Um, A lot of credit checks, which I was a bit hesitant giving, given that I'm a student and don't really have much credit to my name. I also had people ask for employment uh, letters, which is fine and dandy. Um, I had people ask for pay stubs in which I was a student. I don't, I wasn't working. I was a full-time student, so I wasn't really working. And even then I didn't really have a pay stub for the company in Kelowna. I hadn't, I haven't started at that point. Also a lot of like, oh, people are also as, oh, I want to see your bank statement. I'm like, why do you want to see my bank statement? Why do you want to see what I spend in a month? It's like, no, I just want to see how much you have in your bank. I'm like, no, I just rather not give that information. You know, one of the things that I found is that they can choose to be picky like this just because there's so many people applying at one time, right? Kelowna is a tourist town that booms in the summer. A lot of leases run from September to April and then apartments are converted to short-term rentals like Airbnbs. So why isn't there more rental supply to follow that demand? There has been a boom of new developments in Kelowna in the past two, three years, but they're not affordable. Um, And the reality is, Kelowna is growing, but we don't have any more land to grow out. Um, So unfortunately, we had to build up. That means changing zoning laws, um, bylaws, um, and that needs to go through council and that takes forever, right? So I think there's a multiple, like multitude of factors here and it just compounds into this massive problem. And it's a housing crisis really in the city. As a longtime renter, Paula has met her share of difficult landlords. Uh, Troubles is really putting it lightly. I mean, unfortunately, my previous few landlords have not been too amicable to work with, mostly because at the end of my lease, um, all of the landlords have been like, we're not giving you back your deposit. And I'm like, okay, what happened? Because I obviously have not damaged the apartment to a considerable degree. And they're like, well, we found some holes. I'm like, that that was not here when I left. So I don't know what happened. A lot of people consider renting a pit stop along the way to home ownership. And while Paula wants to own one day, she can't afford it right now. As frustrating as her experiences have been, Paula doesn't quite have a solution for others. She's decided to accept all the stuff that comes with not owning. I kind of put up with it. <laughs> well, like, maybe that's not the right term. I think that... Like in this point of my life, like renting is just my reality because I'm still, I'm still young. I'm still moving. Um, I'm actually moving to Calgary quite soon, but that means that renting is just going to be part of my life because if I'm moving a lot, especially this like early in my journalism career, I'm inevitably going to be moving places and I can't do that if I'm tied down to a property, right? Um, And it's not like I can afford property anyway. (laughs) 
Paula's story is an important reminder that it's not just renters in big cities that are feeling the squeeze. Rents are also rising in smaller communities. The rise of remote work has sent a flood of buyers or new renters into these places, so it's making it tougher for everyone. After the break, we'll hear from a couple with two young kids who are currently renters and have very different opinions about their scenario. Hi, I'm John Graham, President and CEO of CPP Investments. COVID-19 is the most serious challenge we faced in a generation. It has tested our physical and our mental health, and also the financial security of many. I am pleased to report that the CPP Fund withstood the stresses and the volatility of the global pandemic. The fund remains strong and is sustainable for the next 75 years. At CPP Investments, we're investing today for your tomorrow. Please visit cppinvestments.com to learn more. There's a lot to consider as parents when you're renting, from the amount of space you need and access to things like playgrounds, schools, and community centers. We spoke with a millennial couple with two young kids that have been renting in Markham, Ontario. Hi, my name is Fatima and I'm 27 years old and I'm a stay-at-home mom. I have two kids. One is a two-year-old and the other is nine months old. Uh, I'm Murtaza. I came here after getting married to Fatima. My hometown is Pakistan. Fatima grew up in a rental basement unit with her mom and sisters in Markham. Their landlord lived upstairs and became a close family friend. Murtaza, on the other hand, grew up in Pakistan. His family owned their home. So their personal housing history has shaped their outlook on renting versus buying. To be honest, for me, buying a house or or a principal applicant is very important for a long-term investment. If you look at it as a like a, as a temporary or a, on a on a like five to ten ten years of time, it won't it won't be a successful uh like a investment. But if you look at it as a long term investment for your kids or for your maybe for your retirement plan, I know that there are a lot of people like they say, oh, renting versus buying, you you end up paying more if you are buying a house or whatever mortgage payment or anything like that. So I agree, but on a on a bigger scale, on a larger picture, uh, if you have a house, it keeps on increasing in, in value. The family lives in a 1400 a month basement unit. It has two bedrooms, a large kitchen, one bathroom, a living room, and a play area for their kids. They also have parking. They have a great relationship with their landlord, an older couple who lives upstairs. And Fatima's happy with the way things are. She doesn't feel like she's missing out because they don't own. I don't know. Like, I, I'm just really glad to have a space of my own. It didn't matter where it was. My priorities were more so, like, having grocery stores nearby, every, like, having um, uh, a pharmacy at a walking distance, having five minutes to the hospital. So these were my priorities. And then we wanted, like, space for our kids to have, like, um, to be able to live it, have their own room and, like, have their um, toys and whatever it is. The family has been renting there for almost three years. Their rent just went up by $100. But for Fatima, that still works for their budget. I mean, $1,400 was a little bit like, oh man, another $1,000, like $1,200 for the year is gone up. Considering if I were to like, be like, oh, you're raising the rent, I'm going to move out. I'd have to pay a lot more to move out to a new place. It's a lot easier for me to just be like, all right, $100 a month, we'll budget a bit more. Fatima and Murtaza often talk about whether to own or rent. Right now, they can't afford a place in the big city. So Murtaza is considering homes further from the greater Toronto area. So the houses, housing market due to COVID has been, he has skyrocketed crazy, right? I think uh, I would, if I, if I ever moved on, like uh, to buying a house, I would rather go to a further place not in the GTA, but uh, outside of GTA, more towards the uh, Oshawa side or more towards north or towards Barrie. So that's my my goal. And that's where I'm looking to buy a house because I want to invest in something like to to get a value as well. I don't want to buy a house like 
in just a one room and you are living in a you it's the same as price you are getting a house in Whitby. But what does Fatima think? And a lot of my times my husband's like, "Oh, let's move out, let's go somewhere else." And then I'm like, "Uh, no. <laughs> I don't want to <laughs> cuz I'm at a, like a perfect location where I'm like in a happy place where my mom's 10 minutes away and everything else is also like a minute or 10 minutes away from me and I and I don't want to like leave it cuz when he thinks of it renting, he thinks of it as like I'm giving my money away for to somebody else which is not necessary. I can use that money for like investment in my own property or anything that's mine." For me it's like it's not like that it's more so like oh I'm using this space so I am giving money for it like nothing comes free but I'm not paying and plus I'm I don't have enough that I'm like oh I would like to purchase and I don't want to do like loans and all that stuff because that's a lot more stressful cuz I don't know I rather just rent cuz it's it's easier um and if I ever want to leave it's a lot easier I can be like okay I'm going to pack up and just go if I ever had to Um it's not like a permanency where I'm just stuck in space. For Fatima, renting is less stressful than owning a home, and she's sticking to that opinion. Honestly, owning a place would be a lot more difficult cuz that's like another child cuz if anything goes wrong with like your own property or house, you are the sole responsible person to get it fixed. Like you have to go find like if your fence breaks down, like you have to go find a contractor and get that fixed and get quotes. Then um you have or if your heater breaks, like if your heating in your house has issues, then you have to do everything by yourself, right? So that is a lot more uh, of a task for me. Um I'd prefer something where somebody else takes care of all that. So if if something does go wrong in my house, like if i have an issue with electrical or if i have an issue with my oven or like anything like that i can just be like hey can you get it fixed and i know they will get it fixed like right away mertaza has big dreams of buying a house but with only one of them working right now and a family to raise it's a challenge to save saving is a little hard because it's not just the rent but everything else like um we have like a car we have kids so you know by end of the month we try to budget but it always goes kind of over under like depending we're kind of living sort of barely saving i would say so whatever we make is kind of whatever we spend so right now um i'm working um like i'm putting in more work i'm doing some overtimes as well to just cater the cost and then the saving cost i i want to uh, get 20 person i'm trying from back home as well where i can like get some money and if i have some put in 20 person and then every year when you get time to put in more money to just lower down the mortgage cost and whatever the the percentage so when mertaza can afford to buy his dream home what would it look like i'm looking for a, a three bed housing um and also with something with the backyard a good where, where i can grow some you know vegetables fruits in summers and uh, and also a finished basement with the maybe where where i can have some hangovers or parties with my friends and maybe a pool in a corner just to enjoy or maybe a sauna <laughs> you know i i i think this is a really interesting story because this couple is living the debate buying versus owning and they're articulating positive points about both and it highlights just the fact that there's no right one true perfect way to live there's great things about renting and there's great things about owning and i think people as housing gets more expensive will have to give uh, consideration to both points of view for those with a goal of home ownership renting lets them save for a down payment well that's if they can find an affordable rental where they have monthly savings so what are renters doing to battle high costs and will these prices keep rising At the end of December 2021, I spoke with Shane Dingman, a Globe and Mail colleague who covers real estate. Here's part of our conversation. Shane, what's the mood out there among renters? I see increasing frustration, anger, and even despair among people who are hoping to find an affordable rental that will let them save a down payment for a house. Yeah, it's actually a really interesting time because for the last two years things have not been uh, that bad for some renters. Right now, 
we should make a distinction that when you're talking about the rental market, there are people in the sort of affordable band, people who are looking for below market rent. That has not been an easy place to live for like a couple decades now. We Governments have gotten out of the business of building affordable rental. They're starting to get back into that, but it's still taking a long time to deliver new units. And so for those folks, it's always been a bit of a challenge to find a rent that allows them to not pay like 50% of their, of their wages to rent. For everybody else, though, people who are not um, so sensitive to sort of uh, cost of living stuff, you know, you've got condo rents in, in the big cities have typically been higher than average rents overall. And those renters are often young professionals who are, have good salaries. They have had a pretty decent year, two years, really, because throughout 2020, a lot of those folks saw their rents fall in the major centers if they were staying there. And if they were one of those people who left the big cities to go to somewhere else, they were moving into markets that had traditionally lower rents. Maybe those rents went up a little bit while they were there, but not in the same period, sort of sort of velocity you saw elsewhere. So only in the sort of latter half of 2021 have we seen rent start to pick up again uh, nationally and in, in the in the big cities. It's been an interesting couple of years for renters. It was not terrible uh, and, and in fact good for some, but it's getting a little bit more expensive again. Shane, what are some things you see renters doing to cope with expensive rents? Well, one of the things we haven't really talked about too much that is totally a thing that happened over the pandemic was people moved out of the big expensive cities and they found rentals in other parts of the country and they were able to work remotely. Um, you know, I know people who went, moved to like New Brunswick, not just to buy, but to rent, you know, like if you could find a rental in New Brunswick, the rates would be so much lower than you were paying in Montreal or Toronto or Vancouver. You know, so like there's lots of markets where rental rates are not as bad. Um, and you kind of have to get outside of like the bedroom community of the big cities to find those really, really, really cheap rents, but they're available. And now that work is more remote, um, that's possible. You know, that continues to be possible. I don't see um, people rushing back to the office yet. You know, I think if you're if you're hoping to have a creative solution and live in a studio apartment in a big city, I'm not sure there's much option for you. Those are going to be expensive. Those are the most desirable units oftentimes. Right. So um, it's going to be tough. Shane, what trends do you see in rents for 2022 onward and upward? Are we going to see increases in uh, across all fronts? Yeah, there's no question. Uh well, I mean, again, uh, I should not predict. It's bad to be in the prediction business. But barring another major resurgence in pandemic restrictions and, and pandemic travel and, and sort of economic shutdown, and like those kind of things can still happen. So-called exogenous events, right? We've just had the mother of all exogenous events um, over the last couple of years. Those can continue to happen. Those will shake things up if they do. But yeah, if, if things are on their current trend, more expensive, right? More, more expensive. But the other thing that we haven't really talked about is that like, if you compare rental costs to ownership costs, it can be pretty competitive, right? Because I'm sure you've discussed this many times, the down payment requirements are so huge now to get into the ownership market. And then the carrying cost can also be quite high once you get into that ownership market. That sometimes when you do those calculations about what would my rental, what would my carrying cost if I lived in, if I bought this condo instead of just rented it? And oftentimes it's higher than the rent. There are still lots of condos, for example, that are rented out that are renting for less than the cost of owning them. And the owners in those cases are betting that the uh, price appreciation of that unit will eventually make it all work. But if you wanted to be that owner, you'd be paying those higher costs than the rent is. So uh, there's still a better deal out there for somebody who doesn't have a big down payment and you know um, who's looking at the cost of living. It's probably still cheaper for a lot of those people to rent than to try to own. I think what the what we really need to alleviate the stress on renters is purpose built corporate owned rental buildings because we haven't really talked about the you know the big downside of all that uh, rental condo stock which is rent evictions people saying you know what uh, I think my my nephew is going to be moving in there I want to jack up the rent and you know if you ask around people um, what they dislike about renting that manhandling by landlords is the number one by far foul living conditions coupled with landlords who don't care and ran, landlords who rent evict and when you're uh, in the purpose built old fashioned high rise high rise rental which no one seems to talk about and yet there's dozens of these buildings in every city i lived in a couple of them myself in my earlier years great places to live owned by corporations you know rent controlled rents um, but we did talk about how there is so much stock in condos and there is this rent eviction problem. How, what, do we, what can we do about that? When we're talking about those purpose-built rentals again, and right now it's the luxury ones, things like that, 
what we're sort of not mentioning is that in the 60s and the 70s, there was much more generous tax benefits for a builder of purpose-built rental from, from the federal government and from the provincial governments. And those went away. And that's what really slowed a lot of that building down. And, you know, if you want to look at like, where, where do you get more rental from? Putting back some tax benefit to building purpose-built rental and affordable rental would be a good idea if you want that social good to be created. Also, we're not talking about things like co-op or government-owned, municipal, like, you know, sort of affordable housing from like um, from the cities and things like that. Those are also areas where, where more investment could be done. We're spending billions of dollars on, on, on pandemic relief. You know, maybe you can say spare a billion or two for some of these programs to build some more units for people. Um, that might help. Shane, can you give me one or two hopeful takeaways for renters who feel under stress? They're having trouble finding affordable rental. They're wondering if anybody cares about their situation. And uh, they need a place to sort of live for a few years while they can build up a down payment, at least take a try at home ownership. Well, I think the age old, you know, sort of renter strategy for saving is to get roommates, you know, <laughs> you know, it's not, it, there's obviously there's services that do this. Um, you know, there's all sorts of places that try to hook you up with good roommates and things like that. Like, but like, you know, sharing costs is a smart way to go. I know a lot of people, you know, who are in the ownership market at some point or another had help from parents, either by living with their parents while they were saying, um, that's not an option for everybody, right? So, but if they're, if you can't rely on the bank of mom and dad, maybe try to work with friends. There is also a lot of more co-buying going on out there. And again, you know, if you're a renter and you're thinking about, maybe I'd like to do some co-buying, I can buy with my friend, we'll, we'll, we'll go to in together on a house, maybe rent together too, right? So save your costs together. One thing that strikes me as I look at housing in 2022 is that we have to get our heads out of this space where we regard renting as a transitional phase and that everybody who rents will eventually make their way into home ownership. I don't see how the numbers work with prices rising like they are. What about you? Agreed. I think it's important to note that not all renters are homeowners in waiting. The financial industry has to also get on board in terms of providing better advice for these people, because right now what we're seeing is a lot of advice, a lot of messaging. Everything's geared towards the dream of buying a home. One of our missions on Stress Test is to dispel this belief that renters are financially second-class citizens, that this is a second-class option. Renting your whole life is not going to be a fairy tale, but it's not going to be a disaster. It can work for you. And the sooner we make that switch, the sooner we're going to get in line with some of the changes that are already happening. I'm going to go back to the survey we did on renting. And one of the numbers that really jumped out at me, 34% of people say they feel judged as renters, judged by their families, judged by their friends. Um, it's time to stop doing that. Renting is a rational way to live when you can't afford a house. We just have to accept that. Here are three takeaways for renters. One, if you're a renter, you have to be an aggressive saver and a disciplined investor if you want to end up with close to as much money as a homeowner. But it is possible. Don't let anyone tell you otherwise. Two, renting has its benefits. It gives you the flexibility to do things like jump on a job offer in a different location or try living in a new city or town. And when those expensive repairs show up, it's your landlord on the hook, not you. Three, renting is still cheaper than owning, but not as dramatically as it once was. With rents getting more expensive, it will take you longer to save for financial goals like a house down payment, a trip, or for retirement. So keep that in mind. Thanks for listening to Stress Test. The show is produced by Amy Chan and Zara Kozema. Audio engineering and editing by Kyle Fulton. Our executive producer is Kieran Rana. Thank you to guests Paula, Fatima, Murtaza, and Shane. In our next episode, we're looking at Gen Z and millennials who are supporting their parents and family financially. If you like what you heard, give us a five-star rating and a review on Apple Podcasts. You can find Stress Test at Apple Podcasts, Google Play, Spotify, or your favorite podcast app. And find us at theglobeandmail.com, where we cover all things financial. Thank you for listening.